This video contains heavy spoilers for the backstory and story of all four outs as well as the DLC in Fire Emblem Three Houses. Hello there, today I want to talk about Fire Emblem Three Houses, a game I have been playing a lot lately and have grown to like a lot. This video will mainly concern certain aspects of the game's main antagonistic faction, known colloquially as those who slither in the dark, though I will call them the Agartans for both the sake of brevity and because this is their true name. They are a technologically advanced group of people who live in the underground city Shambhala and their actions drive much of the game's backstory and main plot, with some examples, being responsible for Nemesis' rise to power and so instigating the subsequent War of Heroes, orchestrating the founding of the Kingdom and the Alliance, and masterminding the war featured in the game's second part. However, the main plot of the game is not what I want to focus on today, rather something that is a bit more in the background, how their research and development methods are refined over the course of Three Houses' timeline. This is mostly something found in smaller details concerning various legendary weapons and monster classes in the game. First, a bit of context, however. Long before the events of Three Houses, the Gartens were the dominant civilization of the continent Fotlan, in actuality the original humans that existed there, having been granted knowledge by the goddess Sothis and her children, the Nabataeans. However, they warred amongst themselves, which caught Sothis' ire. Fearing she would destroy the world in her fury, they launched their advanced weaponry at the goddess, but no matter what they threw at her, it did nothing. In the end, they were defeated. This war destroyed the earth and most of the Agartans, the remnants retreating to Shambhala. They swore revenge on the goddess and her children for this turn of events, spending many centuries engineering many heinous plans towards this end. Revenge is a central concept throughout the lore and plot of Three Houses, and for the Agartans, this is where the legendary weapons and monster classes in the main game come in as these are some of the main vehicles through which they commit their revenge, and in game it can be seen how the gardens develop and refine them over time. Let us begin with the weapons. To start off with, a lot of things can be pieced together from smithing materials. In three houses, weapons can be brought to a blacksmith and repaired with the use of smithing materials, indicating what the various weapons in the game are made of. One smithing material that is relevant for us is called agarthium, which is used to repair several weapons confirmed to be tied to the Gartens. Examples include the Scythe of Sauriel, which can be repaired by the substance, and the knife Athame, which is mentioned to be made of some uncommon and unknown substance. The name also hints at this connection, as does the item description, which mentions that it was made using archaic methods, which is a phrasing that shows up a lot in the game when talking about the Gartens. Two notable weapons that can be repaired with Agarthium are the Devil Sword and Devil Axe, unholy weapons that inflict damage on their wielders when used in battle. Based on the fact that these weapons seem to be made of Agarthium, and that their designs feature a prominent evil eye, something commonly associated with Agartans, I think it is likely that these are some of the earliest weapons to be made by the Agartans. This is also because these weapons are quite weak and primitive compared with their later work. The Agartans' next work are the main legendary weapons of three houses, the hero's relics. After her war with the Agartans, Sotis restored the world over an extremely long period of time and went to sleep in the holy tomb afterwards out of exhaustion. The Agartans took advantage of this and manipulated the bandit Nemesis into breaking into the holy tomb. He absolved with the Sotis's body and brought it to the Agartans, after which she was murdered by them and her body was made into the sword of the creator, the first hero's relic. Nemesis then went to Xanado, the canyon near the holy tomb where the Nabataeans lived, and slaughtered most of them. This gave the Agartas more raw materials and so they crafted the other 11 heroes relics. Each of the relics consists of two main parts, the weapon itself and a crest stone. The weapons are made of the bones of the various Nabataeans, while the crest stones are their extracted hearts. The crest stones are necessary for the heroes relics to channel power through them as well as a wielder who has blood with the corresponding crest to give it the power necessary to function. When someone who does not have a crest wields a relic, they receive damage. This is similar to the devil weapons, hinting that these are earlier attempts at using artificial materials to create relic-esque weapons. Of note is that the 12 original heroes relics are all repaired in game by the use of umbral steel, 
In game, this material can be obtained by breaking the shields of and defeating Nabataeans, as well as some monster types. When fighting the Immaculate One and the Wind Caller in game for example, when their shield is broken, Umbral Steel is obtained, some of their horns break off. This, in tandem with the fact that the hero's relic are made of Nabataean bone, suggests that Umbral Steel is Nabataean bone. The hero's relics are objects made of genuine Umbral Steel and crest stones. However, it also seems that the Agartans tried their hand at creating artificial crest stones at this time. I say this mainly because of the Fetters of Tromai, a relic that was created around the same time as the other 12, but has a peculiar crest stone. This relic is tried to the crest of Oban, one of the four apostles who were members of the Church of Saros in its early days. It seems that these apostles are Nabataeans in disguise, similar to the four saints, though this is not directly confirmed. However, the contrary, that the apostles were humans who obtained the blood of the Nabataeans, like Nemesis and his allies, the Ten Elites, does not make much sense. The Church of Saros was founded by the Nabataean Saros, partially as part of her revenge against Nemesis for his massacre of the other Nabataeans. She held great resentment against him and the Ten Elites for using the corpses of her brethren as weapons, and hunted each of them down to ensure their demise. Considering this, it is not feasible that Saros allowed the four apostles to be part of her church, or even live, if they were like the Ten Elites. She would especially not allow them to perform a task as important as the Rite of Rising, which was supposed to bring Sothis back to life. It also seems that Alban himself was alive until just before the game, since the only character that has his crest, Yuri, was gifted it by a mysterious old man. Though the identity of this man is not confirmed, it does seem likely that he was Alban himself. The way the process through which Yuri received his crest is described also seems different from human to human crest transfusion, which in other cases can only be done through a very traumatic process that turns the receiver's hair white. Yuri did not suffer from this indicating that the old man he received his crest from was not human. The process was also so peaceful that Yuri was not even aware of it happening, a far cry from the barbaric methods involved in human to human crest transfer. The Gardens then may have made an artificial crest stone of Alban, perhaps from some blood of his they obtained. During the game itself, they are namely very keen on collecting Nabataean blood they do not yet possess, perhaps to make artificial crest stones out of. It is also known that they produce artificial crest stones, as monsters produced by them are known to wield such stones. This would mean that the crest stone of Alban was their first foray into making these things. The next relics produced by the Agartans follow this trend, moving away from the raw materials obtained from the Nabataeans and trying to replicate them instead. The Varya Mushti is another relic tied to the four apostles, in this case Chevalier. This one was made some time after the others, as it is said to be a replica from after the War of Heroes. The crest stone of Chevalier, within the Varya Mushti, also seems to be another artificial crest stone, since Chevalier was an apostle. The fetters of Dromai, in the Varya Mushti, themselves still seem to be made of umbral steel however, as this is the material with which they can be repaired. This changes with the next relic, Eimer, the personal weapon of Edelgard in the second half of Three Houses. This weapon was made specifically to work with Edelgard specifications, herself being a result of Agartan experimentation as well. Eimer is tied to the crest of Saros, but has the crest stone of the beast within it, indicating that the crest stone is artificial. The weapon is also repaired with Agartium instead of Umbral steel, meaning that the Agartans at this point are also able to successfully create artificial Nabataean bone in the form of Agartium. The pinnacle of this line of research then are the Dark Relics. These are dark replicas of the original hero's relic, Sans Bloodgang, because of circumstance, wielded by the revived ten elites in Nemesis in the endgame of Verdant Wind. They are black in color, and each have a replica of a crest stone that can be found in the corresponding regular relic. The exception to this is the Dark Creator Sword, which has two crest stones in it, those corresponding to the remaining apostles, Noah and Timotheus. This is likely to channel the power of his crest of flames, which is more powerful than other crests due to being tied to Sothis. Based on their strange coloration, these weapons seem to be entirely made out of Agarthium, meaning the Agartans outgrew the need for umbral steel somewhere near the end of three houses. That finishes one line of research, but what about monsters? In three houses, there are a great number of monster types that stalk the wilds of Fotland 
are used as weapons of war during the second half of the game. These creatures are inextricably linked to crest stones, as people who do not have a crest and wield relics are eventually transformed into these beasts by the crest stone of the relic. This is shown first hand in the game when the bandit Miklan is covered in a black substance that emerges from the crest stone of his stolen relic and he is then transformed into a monster. It can also happen if one with a crest uses a relic too often, as happened with the elite Maurice, who was subsequently erased from history. The gardens are interested in researching and weaponizing this phenomenon, as shown during the events of the game, perhaps inspired by what happened to Maurice. However, there are indications they have been experimenting with it long before the game starts. There are four types of wild monsters in the game that are common across the land. Giant wolves, birds and crawlers, as well as wild daimonic beasts. The first three seem to be the earliest products of this line of research. Common animals that grew gigantic due to absorbing copious amounts of magic. Specifically, they ingested dark stones, which they also used as their weapons. The giant crawlers in particular also drop agarthium, tying them explicitly to the agartans. The dark stones might have been very early attempts of the agartans to replicate the effects of crest stones but result in creatures that are far weaker than the monsters produced by the crest stones. The next step would be to use actual crest stones, or at least artificial ones. Enter the wild demonic beast. This is a human that has absorbed the crest stone whose crest has become unreadable. These creatures are similar to the Nabataeans, being classified as dragons like the Nabataeans and are far stronger than the giant animals. Once the gardens gained the ability to create crest stones, it seems they started to recreate this form of demonic beast. The Agartans would go on to iterate on this form, however. We now get to the events of Three Houses proper in regards to monsters. Throughout the first part of the game, the Agartans undertake various experiments that involve monsters. Their potential first attempt at this is through the Chalice of Beginnings, which is featured in the DLC side story Cinder Shadows. Though it was intended to revive Sothis, the Chalice only produces monstrous umbral beasts. In Cinder Shadows, the Church Cardinal Alfric tries to obtain the chalice and is working with some shady people to accomplish this. They are dark mages and assassins who seem to be working for the Adrestian Empire, which the Gartens have under their thumb through Regent Volkhard von Arendel at this time. Perhaps those dark mages are trying to obtain the chalice to study its monster producing effects. Of note is that Cinder Shadows is an alternate continuity to the main game, but it still seems that in the main game, around the same time as Cinder Shadows is supposed to take place, Elfric is kicked out of the church. Perhaps he tried the same stunt as in Cinder Shadows, but was found out early. The next event of relevance is in Remire Village, where the Dark Bishop Solon seems to be in the process of transforming people into monsters, though it is cut short due to the intervention of the Knights of Saros. Around the same time, the Garten Mycen successfully managed to transform people into experimental demonic beasts, as seen in the DLC paralogue A Cursed Relic. Chapter 9, The Cause of Sorrow, is another such experiment. The experimental demonic beast features in these chapters are more resilient versions of the wild demonic beast that seem to have their outer skin layers removed. They are created through the shards of crest stones, which is probably more economical than using whole stones. These beasts are also used by the Gartens and the Adrestian Empire during chapter 10 and chapter 11 as well. After the time skip, in the second half of the game, they have continued this research and developed more sophisticated monsters. There are regular demonic beasts, as well as altered demonic beasts, which were developed in cooperation with the army of the Adrestian Empire and are used as weapons of war. These beasts are decked out in armor, the latter type more so than the former, and are generally more powerful. Of note is also that these beasts wield crest stones that are explicitly denoted as artificial. There are two more variations of demonic beasts encountered during the game, flying and giant demonic beasts. They share the same basic body template as the demonic beasts that are part of the Imperial Army, but are different in key ways, having wings or being very large. The pinnacle of this line of research seems to be Hegemon Edelgard, final boss of Azure Moon. This form of Edelgard was created using archaic methods, which ties to the Gartens and is classified as a monster, but not a dragon. In this form, she is still cognizant, however, and she takes a humanoid appearance, seemingly modeled after the Emperor class. This seems in line with the lack of dragon classification. The transformation is also reversible, both partially, as shown in Fire Emblem Heroes, and fully. These traits may have been put in place by the Gartens since they would not want their ultimate weapon, Edelgard, to go to waste, 
or at least the extraordinarily rare Sotus blood she has within her. Lastly, this form may have been achieved by the use of several quest stones, showing up as orange spots on Hegemon Edugard's body. This also seems to be corroborated by her art in Fire Emblem Heroes, where these spots are shown to be separate from the main black mass that is similar to the one that consumed Miklan. To wrap this topic up, there are still a few stray things that need to be discussed. In the Paralogue Black Market Scheme, Baron Ox steals the Varya Mushti and is transformed into a flying demonic beast due to his usage of it. This is more indication that the crest stone in the relic is artificial, since he is transformed into an Agartan designed creature. Though the crest stone was made long before the flying demonic beast was designed, Apostle Blood is rare, and the Agartans may not have wanted to use that precious resource for this line of research, when they had plenty of other things at their disposal to do so. It's also possible that Baron Ox was the first flying demonic beast, and his transformation inspired the Agartans to create more beasts in the vein of this freak transformation. Lastly, in the Crimson Flower chapter Field of Revenge, the Dew and several Kingdom soldiers have obtained crest stones from the vaults of Fargus Castle and use them to transform into various advanced forms of demonic beasts. This seems inexplicable at first, but they might be yet more artificial crest stones, left behind by Cornelia. She was an Agarthan in disguise, who held considerable sway in Fargus during the first part of the game, and may have left stones in the castle vaults. This is not too unlikely, given the fact that she installed Agarthan tech in the form of Fiscom turrets and Titanus robots in her stronghold, Ferdiad in Azure Moon, an Aryan Road in Crimson Flower. She is also known to have been involved with monsters directly, since she experimented upon Hapi and gave her the power to summon monsters wherever she sighs. This seems to be an exaggerated version of the innate power of the Apostle Timotheus, who could summon and control animals, and whose blood Hapi bears. Cornelia might have done this while researching a way to easily control monsters, but it seems to have backfired, as Hapi is only able to summon them and not control them. And with that, we are more or less done with this discussion. I hope you enjoyed it and to see you next time. Bye.